Welcome back to another session of Better Podcasting Chats with me, SP. This is a streamed and recorded casual chat, also known as a conversation with other hobby and passion podcasters to share their experience, knowledge, joy, and enthusiasm of podcasting. Once this live stream is over, I'm going to take the recorded files because we're podcasters and we record everything. We're going to turn it into a podcast as was requested by the Better Podcasting community. Better Podcasting is a project by Stephen John Drew and myself to help hobby and passion podcasters start their shows and make their existing podcasts better. That's why we call it Better Podcasting. At the start of the show, I just want to say thank you very much to Paul D. Cazanzo from AD Histories Podcast for joining me in the previous chat. Once again, you can check out Paul and his co-host Patrick on AD Histories Podcast at tgnreview.com slash AD History Podcast. You can also check out the previous chat at betterpodcasting.com. Now, for the next few moments, I'm going to talk about my passion, which is space. I'm a rocket scientist. I love space. So over on the NASA side of the house, the Artemis 1 Orion capsule continues its distant retrograde orbit around the moon and is still on schedule for an Earth splashdown on December 11th, 2022. The capsule has now set a record for the farthest distance away from Earth for any human rated spacecraft at 270,000 miles. Although, to be clear, no humans are currently on board the spacecraft, nor were they when it was launched. So nobody was lost so far in the whole thing. NASA also released pictures of how damaged the Artemis 1 launch pad was, including the elevator doors that were literally blown off during the launch of Artemis 1. That was awesome power there. NASA is going to have some work to do to get the launch platform repaired, more protected, and ready for the Artemis 2 launch, which is now scheduled for May of 2024. In the past week, NASA also invited public comment on plans for a Mars sample return campaign. And the comments are due back by December 19th. So yes, we are actually taking a bit of Mars and we're bringing it back to Earth. On the SpaceX side of the house, SpaceX launched a resupply mission to the International Space Station on Saturday, November 26, 2022. The Cargo Dragon capsule arrived safely at the ISS on Sunday, November 27th with new solar arrays and a moon microscope. SpaceX also repaired its Starship orbital launch mount and added protective cladding in advance of the Booster 7's next static fire attempt, which happened today. Yeah, just a few hours ago as we record this episode, SpaceX conducted another static fire of Booster 7 using 11 of its Raptor 2 rocket engines for 13 seconds. It was impressive. Now, hopefully this successful test keeps SpaceX on a path to launch Starship for the first time soon, hopefully before the end of the year. But even if it's at the beginning of 2023, it is still going to be an awesome site. Over on my other podcast activities, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is currently covering the MCU films Thor Love and Thunder and Black Panther Wakanda Forever. And then we're going to end the year covering both the Guardians of the Galaxy and X-Men the Animated Series holiday specials. So check that out at legendsofshield.com. The Better Podcasting main show published episode 265 today about how hobby podcasters can augment their audio podcasts with video. And you can check that out at betterpodcasting.com. In case you are new to Better Podcasting Chats with SP, which is this show right here, if you are a hobby or passion podcaster, I am interested in chatting with you. And if you want to schedule a time to chat with me about your podcasting experience and your podcast, please send me an email to stargatepioneer at betterpodcasting.com, or you can DM me on Twitter if you're still over there or on Discord, and we'll arrange a date to have you on. I have a calendar scheduling link I can send you. In case you don't think this applies to you, it probably does, and I'm excited to chat with you. There's only one more slot left in 2022, so get it while it's hot. There are slots available in 2023. Now, for the next hour, I'm chatting with Steve Barnes. Steve has been a musician for, well, let's just call it four decades, and has played in bands around the Richmond, Virginia area since the 80s. Steve currently creates music under the name Intro Void and plays covers under the name Rebecca Crow. 
Steve currently hosts the Wheel of Time review podcast called Sweet Child of Time on the Marshland Media Network and is branching out to cover a few more shows as well. Welcome to the chat, Steve. Hey, I'm here. Hey there. How's it going? Great, Steve. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. I, is it okay if we back up to some of the uh, some of the space talk that you were saying before? Please go ahead. See, this is a good a good example of how I like step my foot in places I don't belong because I com- I was communicating with you because I knew that you were interested in that space program. I didn't know how deep you were into it, and so I'm just a utility guy that does work up there on Wallops Island and Shinkatig Island. I'm there once a month. And so I happened to be there during the launch and I was really excited to like, you know, share that with you. Just that basic fact, not knowing like how deep into it you actually are. So from my perspective, that launch was interesting. I tried to wake up in the morning for it. I set my alarm. You know, things happened. It didn't go off at five o'clock like it should have. But the launch itself did wake me up. And the way that the Wallops Island launch is set up, the hotel that I stay at is a really nice one. It overlooks Shinkatig Bay. And um, I'm on Shinkatig Island overlooking Wallops Island. That's where I have to drive through the, uh, the NASA training center to get there. So there's always rockets out. and There's always activity happening over there on the island as I drive through. So I was really excited that a launch was happening. So wanted to get up early. Did not get up early. But the launch was so intense that it was, uh, I mean, it was loud audibly loud and I won't I won't say the room was shaking but there was a definite like hum to the room there was like you could feel the vibration I was very close to the launch and it was intense I ran to the uh, balcony and I was overlooking Chesapeake Bay looking at the <laughs> the NASA training center that's where Steve the genius was looking The launch was happening over on the actual launch pad site, (laughs) which I had no view of because there was a building in our way. And there I could see people on the dock out there looking in the looking off, you know, 90 degrees to my left to the launch that I could not see from my balcony. And that morning when I went down to the lobby, you know, all the uh, NASA guys were at the same hotel and high five in each other. And not, not literally, but there was a lot of talk about. It was a good launch, Chester. Yes, it was, Jim. You know, it was a. Everybody was having a <laughs> jolly morning. So I was surprised to see the next day that you were talking about how there was some situation. They had to do like a relaunch. You know the whole story, and you talk about it. But so I was really confused. I was like, I saw a launch. I talked to people about it, and I felt it. And now you're telling me there's there's a relaunch two days later. Yeah, no, that was the I believe it. I think it was the Artemis, one of the Artemis mm-hmm. attempts at the time. You it saw was. a Cygnus capsule, which is a cargo capsule that was right. being launched to the International Space Station. There are launches that happen all the time out of Vandenberg, out west, Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Wallops Island, where you are, mostly sounding rockets. But in this case, it was a capsule that went to the International Space Station. So... It was a different rocket that I was talking about, but everybody was talking about this one because it was going to the International Space Station. And if you've never seen a launch, like you live in the middle of the country and you're not around rockets being launched, you should go to one of the launch sites and see a launch at some point in time. I will say that Kennedy Space Center is probably the best shot because launches get delayed all the time. But if you're there, there's in any given week, there's usually two, maybe three launches that happened. So you're going to see something. The big thing when I was young was watching a space shuttle launch. So catching one of those was hit or miss, but there was always some other launch. And if you've never seen a launch, like you were saying, the whole room was kind of reverberating or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you get close enough, especially to one of these bigger launches, your whole chest reverberates. And it's, you know, it's kind of like the experience of going to a concert and just being pounded by all this mm-hmm. sound, except for it's way, way more. And it's everything around you. Your whole body is vibrating and everything. It's just, <laughs> it's wonderful. That's why I'm a rocket scientist. Cause I love all that stuff. And I love space travel <laughs> and stuff like that. So anyway, you know, a little bit about music because you have been a musician since the eighties. Uh, yeah. Um, my grandfather was a guitar player and he played organ too. And I was really interested in that. So you know, he made sure I had a guitar by the time I think I was 10 or 11. And 
Then my dad bought me a guitar too, an electric guitar, a real guitar when I was like 13. And I just lived in a, I just happened to live in a neighborhood with a lot of other musicians too, yeah, that are still playing to this day. And just happened to, I don't know, it felt like a right place, right time. I made like a direct path leading everything like up till now, because all the experience I had playing music is, has been helpful in podcasting. Back in the eighties, we were recording with this particular group of people between like 1990 and 1996. And it was always on a Tascam, you know, four track recorder. And we knew the ins and outs of that, very comfortable with that. You know, we could make stuff sound good with it. As stuff got a little more experience, we were using like the DAT tapes. I know you remember those things were fabulous. They were great to record on too. A little more complicated. I really preferred the four track cassettes to the DAT tapes because I, you know, once I learn something, I like don't want to learn anything new, which is going to be a theme maybe going throughout the show here. But yeah, being um, around recording and then as I, um, Playing with bands, and I was also in a church band for many years, too. So we would rehearse every week, play every week. And, you know, we tried our hand at recording there, too. I, did, I didn't have a hand in that. My, um, my brother-in-law did. Aside, it gave me a lot of experience being in front of people, being comfortable in front of people, because most of my life I was an introvert and wasn't comfortable in front of people. And I think being in bands, being especially in a church band, having to stand in front of a, a crowd that's not exactly rocking out, you know, they're just kind of standing there or sitting there looking at you while you're playing. So you become comfortable in that environment and that's helpful behind the microphone and speaking in front of any group of people, it's easier now because of that experience of playing in bands. I guess I'm going to segue now into like the most recent band I was in was Medusa switch. And the drummer, Mike Hawley, was the one who did all the recording. He was really good at it. And really, I don't know, he was really finicky about it. And he used Cubase. And it was really, he, he preferred like the grid pattern, whereas I, I'm more of like the sound waves, I suppose. <laughs> but um, he was really a stickler about the grids and playing in the grids and staying in the grids to make it easier for the edit. And he taught me a lot about that because I would always, you know, be there with him, helping him edit the whole band was it was a, a good experience like doing that with other people too because other people would be asking questions about features that i would never even think about so that experience was good and after medusa switch I, you know i'll admit i left the band like in a um a rage quit it was a rage quit situation but i'm still in very good terms with everybody now i'm very good at apologizing for things that i can do but that aside, when I left that band, I didn't want to play in bands anymore. I wanted to play by myself. And I was writing music by myself and recording, quote unquote, recording myself. I was using this as a loop pedal. I would just, this holds like thousands of hours of, you know, riffs and music and you can layer stuff on it. So that was my first experience by myself. Then it's behind me. I'm not going to show it out, but the Tascam, the exact same Tascam four track that we were recording back on the 90s, my friend Sam cleaned it up and gave it to me. So I was able to start recording my stuff on it. So I had all these tapes that I had of just, you know, goofy stuff I was doing. I was doing like stylophone music, just putting together just anything just for fun, just to. Because music has never been anything that has paid or anything. You know, my job is a utility tech. And at any rate, through the podcast, Grift Horse, which is another podcast I'm a big fan of, it's a podcast basically about saving money. And I met a friend, James, through that podcast just because we were both fans of the show when we met, like, I think either on the Discord or I'm not exactly sure how we first came in touch. But everybody who was a fan of that show would also like bring ideas to the show, kind of like you. You know, you bring people on to talk about podcasting. People would write into Grift Horse and say, you know, uh, the Panera 
drink club is on, you know, you can get free drinks at Panera, you know, this thing is happening. James brought to the table, he was a podcaster, he's a musician, and, you know, he knew how to publish music easily, get it online, and make money, and make money off your streams. And this was a new idea to me, but it was appealing to me. I had these cassette tapes, and I was like, I guess I could do that. Because the way James worded it when he, like, first wrote into Grift Horse, or maybe it was on the Discord, he was just basically saying, anybody can get a song on Spotify just by getting a publishing service. For example, DistroKid, that's what I use currently. And the way James did it, he, would, he said, just open up an audio file and put a beat on there and then hum something on top or layer something on top. And then you got a song. Then you can put it on Spotify. It doesn't matter if it's good or not. You can stream it and you can make 0.3 cents off every stream. And it was, you know, just a fun little grift idea to like make a couple dollars or something. And I was like, sure, I can do that. So I decided to take it a step further, though, because I had music that I actually kind of liked and I actually put some stuff in. Not great stuff, but I was like, it was more than just some sound file to put on Spotify. It was like I had music that I actually enjoyed and I wanted to put it out there. So that is what I did. That was my first step towards podcasting was taking those cassette tapes and getting one of those. That was my first purchase I made was uh, besides having band equipment was I bought like one of those super USB cassette converters that can convert your cassettes to USB uh, to MP3s. It's really crappy and you have to hold it like a certain way or it will start like vibrating and that vibrating will come through on the recording. And you can hear on some of my early recordings, they're pretty crappy and they have a lot of like really weird quirks and hums and stuff in them. And that is why eventually I got into at first, I wanted to just try Audacity because James was encouraging me strongly. He was like, you know, these are great because he, uh, I should say that too. He and I were kind of trading music back and forth. And I was, he was sending me uh, some files of him rapping. And then I would convert those to cassette. And then I would like put three weird tracks on top of it and put a beat on top of it. And, you know, we would have a collab right there. And so I was publishing those and James was encouraging me strongly to get into digital, which I was, I was uh, apprehensive to because I was comfortable with cassettes. That's all I had recorded on before besides pedals. And I, uh, you know, was just nervous, I suppose. And eventually he was right. I fell into soundtrack because I, the computer I was using at the time was a Google Chromebook. $99 Google Chromebook. And um, I think by this point, by the time I'd started putting music online, I think James had had me on his podcast once to promote some of my music. And I really enjoyed it. I enjoy talking. I haven't stopped talking yet, which is, <laughs> I've listened to a lot of your past shows. And that's why I feel comfortable keeping talking because most of your guests get on here and, and talk like this, right? Well, we just want to know about you and your origins and where you came from in podcasting to set the stage for some of the harder questions later. Yeah, I'm rambling. I'm sorry. I, I forgot this is a conversation. You're not interviewing me. So I'll, I'll cut. Let me cut to the chase. I, yeah, I recorded, did cassettes. Now I do digital. There you go. <laughs> All right. So you're recording digitally. But what drove you from music to actual podcasting? Always loved podcasting. First got an iPod in 2008, and one of the first things I did was discover the NPR podcast they had out there, because I would work in my truck a lot by myself, and that's what I, you didn't get tired of listening to music after a while, so I would just listen mm -hmm. to NPR. So NPR podcasts were a natural progression, so then when I discovered that there was more podcasts, there was so many political podcasts, I was listening to The Young Turks, the Majority Report. There were so many political podcasts, but I decided I wanted, to, and I stuck to it to this day. I only stick to one political podcast that I listen to on a weekly basis because there's so many good ones out there. But uh, 
<laughs> what was the question again, sir? <laughs> what drove you from music to podcasting? So we've gotten to the point where you're listening, you're listening to podcasts, which is where a lot of us started. And a lot of us started in music too, back in the day, a little less so now because the gear is a little bit more plentiful for everybody to have. Oh, yeah. But, so you have the gear to actually record your voice and you have this interest in talk radio or podcasts because you're listening to them out on your line truck. Yeah. What drove you to actually start recording one? Well, um, I guess directly that would be James. Cause I think the point I was trying to get to was I listened to one political podcast and then everything else was a comedy podcast. That's my main thing is, um, improv comedy or just conversational comedy. I like recap podcasts too. Obviously that's what I do, but it was, um, you know, being a guest on mostly speaking Sentai and on James's podcast and just being in that environment I, was appealing. He had me on another podcast after that as well. And that's about when I decided I've been listening to him enough and I wanted to just give it a shot because I enjoyed talking to James and I just enjoyed it in general. And I like the format of like a recap podcast. I got to say, I have a tendency to ramble like this. So when I do like a recap podcast, it's, it's a natural chunk of times you can do natural segments that come up. So it, it's a natural time to stop talking and for the other person to start. Well, both Steven and I would say that a recap podcast or a review podcast on like a TV show is a great starter podcast because first of all, mm -hmm. television shows and seasons. So you'd have a natural start and end point. And then there's ready-made content for you to review, yeah. right? You're not looking for content to create. So it's, it's a great starter. You can continue your entire podcast career doing that. We've got a lot of people on the Gonna Geek Network that do that. But yeah, I, I enjoy the format myself. I've been doing those for a while. Voices of Defiance, Starling Tribune. I guessed it on some like Walking the Walking Dead, which is Steven's podcast on Walking the Walking Dead, Walking the Dead, Walking <laughs> Dead back in the day when he was doing that. And then, of course, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. on the Marvel Cinematic Universe started out as Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. review podcast. We've been going for over 450 episodes now. So, right. yeah, it's it's ready made. If you're just wanting to get into podcasts and don't know what to podcast, you know, right. pick your favorite IP and go for it. You know, if I was starting a podcast today, probably be like from nothing. Like it was my first podcast. It was probably be The Expanse, which I podcasted on on somebody else's show. And then uh, also Stargate, you know, Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis, whatever. There's a ton of material out there. If you like Star Trek, if you like Star Wars, tons of material out there to podcast on. And you chose the <laughs> Wheel of Time to start with, right? Yeah, not a great choice. Some of my first choices are not first choices, but my early choices, I was thinking of doing um, Little House on the Prairie or Highway <laughs> to Heaven. Because I really enjoyed those shows when I was younger. And then I, I enjoyed them kind of like, you know, tongue in cheek, ironic, because I was, you know, a teenager when those shows were out. So I recognized they were super goofy. I'm talking about Highway to Heaven in this respect. Little House on the Prairie, I like, you know, I was a little kid and that show meant a lot to me. Highway to Heaven, I, I guess I looked at it in a more like teenage, ironic eye, but I just loved the wholesomeness of it. I thought that would be a fun show to do. And I don't know. I chose Wheel of Time because I really enjoy the books. And the TV show didn't really get a good, good audience. I, I don't think it got really good reviews. And a lot of book readers really didn't like it. But I knew that there was a group of people out there like myself that were, you know, loved the books and read them multiple times and also thought the show was pretty cool, too. But I didn't realize how small that group actually was. So basically, I really went easy on myself. Like you said, recap podcasts are like, you know, really easy to do. The ready-made material there. But you kind of want to have an audience, too. And it depends on what your goal is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. My goal was just to podcast and have fun. I recognized it was a small crowd. And, it, you know, when I say small, like... I, a handful of people, like less than 50, generally. 
uh, that were into the Wheel of Time show with me that were like, you know, listening to my show. And I don't know if they were watching the show along with us or not, or just listening to the podcast, but, you know, that were involved in it. There's definitely a group of people because, you know, you always have to promote and find an audience somewhere. And that wasn't easy for what I was doing. So I went for a Wheel of Time group on Facebook that's called the Wheel of Time TV series. That's specifically what the the group is called. And it's a group that just likes the show. And they'll kick out anybody that gets on there and um, is overtly a hater of the show because there's plenty of those out there. And it's not like they don't like negative feedback in that group, but they just don't want to make it an open place for like trolls and people to hate on stuff. And they just wanted to make it a more positive space. So that's basically my group. And this group of people is anxiously waiting for Wheel of Time season two to start up. So I still feel, you know, like I didn't make a wrong choice. I feel like I'm happy where I'm at. I'm happy with a a small group of like 50. But now I'm in a season where I'm waiting for the next, I'm in a half season. Season one, you know, ended way back when. They haven't announced when season two is going to air yet. It's been filmed and stuff, but I don't know the date. So my co-host and myself, James, we're just kind of doing... A little bit of this and that. Um, we did like a Time Bandits recap, the movie Time Bandits, Sweet Child of Time. Why the heck not? Um, and that's another thing I saddled myself with is a silly name. But, you know, I chose it. So there you go. <laughs> all right. Let's unpack a few things. Uh, first of all, confession time. Okay. I have read every single Little House on the Prairie book oh, that Laura great. Ingalls Wilder wrote. I have been to the site of the big house in the little woods. I, as a kid growing up in Walnut (laughs) or in Minnesota, have been to the dugout in Walnut Grove. I've been to the town of Walnut Grove, which is a little bit underwhelming, but it's there. And the dugout depression is still there in the farm, or at least it was when I was out there. There's no big momentous thing. It's literally an active farmer. It was when I was there. So they, (laughs) <laughs> they invite people to come by, see the little depression, and then you can move on and go do something else. I've been to Dismit, South Dakota, which is where they move to next. So, yeah, I've done all that. Uh, yeah, I did have a sister, but yeah, I kind of enjoyed it, too, with the TV show and everything too, yeah. like that. <laughs> and I was, I, was, I was so, so mortified when I learned that they did not film it in Walnut Grove, Minnesota, <laughs> that it was filmed in L.A. <laughs> They're like, no, you're ruining my entire <laughs> head cannon. No, don't do it. No. Okay. They can never ruin your head cannon. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So for somebody who has never read the Wheel of Time books or seen the show on Amazon, can you give a brief explanation, like two or three sentences on what Wheel of Time is? Probably not, because you've heard how I rambled already. That was terrible. I'm, I, I'm still apologizing for how much I'm rambling. No, it's basically about a a group of young kids coming of age, Harry Potter style. You know, this is the tale of as old as time. And um, turns out one of them is like one who's going to save the world. This is a fantasy world that is in a I'm I wasn't prepared to talk about Wheel of Time. So I'm I'm at a loss for words here. But they they um, they discover one of them has huge potential and it is key to humanity. So they have to leave their village and face the harsh world and magic is involved. No elves, but magic is involved. And it's wonderful. (laughs) So like the Harry Potter series, you have a series of books that have been written. Unfortunately, the original author has passed away. There was another author that came in and finished it. So it is a complete series of Mm -hmm. books that they're grabbing source material from to create the Amazon Prime series. And uh, I guess not to to be spoilery, but it's in the far distant future. But because a lot of our society has been lost, it looks like it's like medieval times or something like that almost. Yeah. And I guess the one thing that I really liked about this series, too, like you were saying, one or two sentences, I can say this in one or two sentences. It has a fabulous arc, and the characters all grow in amazing different ways that you would not expect 
any character to grow, and the ending is fabulous. Spoiler alert. So it's great. <laughs> there is a little bit of Lord of the Rings walking going on, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Walking and talking. Yes. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> Sweet Child of Time. That's your podcast name. What is the history of that? I was just looking for a catchy name, and I wanted to use the Guns N' Roses song, you know, as my theme song. I was afraid to a first event because uh, I was just afraid of copyright infringement. But I eventually found like a little, a funny keyboard version of Sweet Child of Time. I'm a sweet child of mine for Guns N' Roses. And I just kind of created the term sweet child to mean a brand new person to a series. You know, James has never, my co-host has never read the book or seen the show. So basically we just would independently watch each episode and talk about it and he liked it a lot. So that made the podcast really fun. And he's a fun person. He doesn't let me ramble. He's, he definitely is very good at guiding conversation and providing a lot of good, funny insight. And I'm doing a new one now. Like we were talking about how I'm, I'm between seasons. I decided to stick to that sweet child theme because I have that one RSS feed. I didn't really want to try to bother getting a brand new RSS feed for a different show, but I did want to go a different direction and recap 1899 because that show really caught my eye on Netflix because I loved the show Dark on Netflix. I uh, loved it a lot. I mean, it was kind of blew my mind and I'm waiting to watch it for a second time because I'm kind of thinking about doing a recap of that show too when I'm done with 1899. There's three seasons of that, though. But I decided to stick with the Sweet Child theme. Call it Sweet Child of 1899. Put it on the same feed, but just have different episodes recapping that with a different co-host. The other co-host I have, though, is not a normal podcaster, so his mic isn't as good as James is. So the sound quality is different with him. So that's a challenge with uh, editing, I suppose. Um, something I'm not used to, but uh, you know, with Soundtrap, it's a it's an app I use to make everything sound as good as humanly possible. So I use all the features within that to uh, tweak my sound. So you moved from musician to podcaster, and you said you wanted to do Wheel of Time with James, and you jumped into that. How did you learn how to podcast? It was real trial and error. I mean, I'd listened to a lot of podcasts, so I listened with a keen ear to a lot of podcasts and. Especially the, the podcasts I was listening to were very meta. They would kind of talk about themselves and they would include the engineer in the conversations. You kind of just pick up context clues, I guess, on how to structure things. James helped me with remaining patient like while we were recording because, you know, I was new at it. So there was things like mic placement. and certain software. I had to get a different computer because the computer I was using couldn't handle the streaming. So having like a patient co-host who's like, you know, helping you through with this was is very helpful. So I had somebody who had three years of experience podcasting as my co-host, not as my engineer. He didn't edit. He didn't do any of that, but he was definitely made himself available for just questions. I didn't bother him with any more than just a few questions at a time. So it was kind of helpful having somebody like that and be, and having the ability to ask, like I asked to be on your podcast and I had the ability to ask James if he would do this with me. I think some people might be afraid to ask podcasters, but they're open to <laughs> conversation too. Yeah. My I keep calling him my podcast mentor, my original podcast mentor is the guy that basically taught me how to podcast, like from the very beginning, I guessed it on his podcast and stuff like that. And it was very good for me to have somebody else to ask at the time, because I didn't know yeah. there were online courses that you could take or YouTube university wasn't as strong as it was as it is now back then, you know, 12 years ago on podcasting. There are still today a lot of 
podcasts about podcasting and and podcast tutorials that cost money and a lot of them at the time cost a lot of money and I wasn't going to pay for that. So it's a little bit of the hobby podcaster mentality that we have is kind of figure it out on our own or we ask or we go to Reddit and find out and stuff like that. There's so many resources now that you can learn how to podcast and having somebody else to lean on is definitely one of the ways to learn how to podcast. You mentioned that you were listening to other podcasts to, to try to figure out how things go in terms of formatting. Is there a specific podcast in itself that you've modeled Sweet Child of Time on, or was it a conglomeration of several podcasts? Yeah, conglomeration of a few. When I first discovered Recap Podcast, I was beside myself because I just love the uh, idea of like being able to drive somewhere and then listen to somebody recap a show that I've watched and do it, you know, do it concisely and with, you know, precision, lots of notes and lots of analysis. And it's great that you can have that in your head. So I've always wanted to do that. So Bald Move Network is a network that does a lot of uh, recap podcasts. And they did the uh, Game of Thrones unofficial recap podcast. And I think that show probably is the format that I was looking for because the guys who do the show, you know, talk like, you know, you and I are talking. There's a lot of deep analysis of their show. They just, I just like their vibe. I just kind of guess learned a vibe from that. And then James also, I kind of followed James's format, except James is a lot more loose in the conversation, but I followed his format for introducing the show and plugging your guests right up front and then having like a succinct plug segment at the end. And then just making sure you have your, plugs at the end as well, making sure you have at least two or three succinct segments. I think I learned that from Bald Move podcasts. And yeah, I think listening to uh, James is mostly speaking Sentai, where he does the, the Power Ranger recaps. It's a looser format, and I took that from James. It, I mean, he's in it. So, I mean, you know, how can it not be like his show? Because he brings his sense of humor to it. But I think it's a... um. I don't know. It's it's a it's like bald move, except you add a really funny off the wall person in there, and it's it's a, it's a neat um neat mix. It always helps to have a comedian as a co host or a third yeah. host or whatever. There's yes. typical like you think in terms if you're doing a panel podcast, there's a typical morning show mentality where you got the straight man, you got the person with uh, um. deep analysis, and then you've got the comedian and. It's named different things, you know, the nerd, the jock, and the whatever. So you, if you, as long as you have something to keep the listener's attention, whatever attention that is, you know, if they're interested in a topic, there should be, in my opinion, some sort of entertainment with it. So you give it to them. That's, I think, the way to go. You mentioned, I want to circle back, something to audio quality, where two of you are on a good mic and your third isn't on a great microphone, mm -hmm. but you're making it work. I will say a lot of people will say as long as the show in itself is listenable, but everybody is on a good mic except for one person. Like if you have two people like you and me, it'd be okay if I was talking to you on a phone call, that sort of thing. My mic's mm -hmm. pretty good, but you're on a phone call. If you have three people, two people are on good mics, one person is not listenable. But as soon as you get into multiple voices not being <laughs> as listenable, then I think it becomes a little bit sporty to produce a podcast so i would just consider that as you go forward to anybody about podcasting only one person can be on a less listenable audio source like a phone call or a laptop microphone or something like that i thought the exact same thing too because i thought maybe if if both of our lines sounded like that i might be a little more concerned but in the app that I'm using, I'm using Soundtrap, which is like this, it's a free app, but I pay for like the $9 a month service so I can save all my files on there. And so I don't have to worry about saving files on my computer. I'm saving them on Soundtrap server instead, but it's very intuitive. And it's, you were talking about people wanting to get into podcasting. This Soundtrap was made for people like myself who don't really know how to get into podcasting because it's very intuitive to use and 
there's a lot of features and I don't think everybody's going to get into all those features that you can get into. I certainly do because I want to take advantage of every single little glitch I can make to make something sound better. But I don't, I mean, I hear other people talking about plugins and um, using expensive software and I don't know. I've made a list of my, my equipment, which is a pretty cheap rundown of stuff. But that Soundtrap app is, is great to use. One of the early people that I had a conversation with was Red Scott, and he was talking all about, yeah. about free plugins that you can get. So you don't necessarily have to pay for the plugins. There's uh, a, a reasonable amount of serviceable free plugins out there if your digital audio workstation or DAW actually uses them. So you mentioned to me that you podcast on the inexpensive side. Mm -hmm. and very minimal gear. So what gear do you use when you podcast? Well, I was using, as I should say, when I first got that iPod back in 2008, I never used, I never had a laptop or a desktop or any sort of computer. I just wasn't a computer person. So I specifically got a Chromebook for recording on and for podcasting. It was a $99 really cheap Chromebook. And of course it was not enough. So I ended up going with, because um, that's the first thing you have to start with. You need, a, you need a laptop. I guess you could do it on your phone, but it's not going to sound great. I picked up a laptop that would have enough RAM to run that Soundtrap app. Because I was having a lot of problems in the early days. And that's when James was being very patient with me. Most of those problems were coming from that app crashing because the computer I was using only had two gigs of RAM. Not enough to run like big files. So I picked up, it was a refurbished Latitude, and it has 16 gigs of RAM, which is like the, the maximum amount that I could afford for under $300. It was a, a laptop, it cost about $250. And besides the laptop, these headphones I bought, these are $29 headphones off Amazon. These mics are great. They're Mayanos. I mean, they're not great, okay? Your mic is great. This mic is acceptable. <laughs> and they're $60 on Amazon. They're called Mayanos. I bought two of these. I like them so much. And then the Soundtrap app is $9 a month. Are those microphones USB or do yeah. you go through? Okay. No, they are USB, but you also, if you can see that uh, you can put it in XLR. My wife okay. uses hers in XLR through like our, um, my wife's a singer. And she has the other microphone over there, but I use that occasionally for podcasting. But it's, yeah, a little bit of both. Okay. So if you could have told your, yourself one thing before you actually started podcasting, mm -hmm. that would have made it easier for <laughs> you. So talk about time travel. If you did that time travel, you went back, you could tell yourself one thing. What would that one thing be to make your life easier as a new podcaster? I think in my earlier podcast in Sweet Child of Time, I was trying to get more people involved and I was uh, trying to squeeze more into it than there needed to be. Uh, I would have a book corner and which is great. You know, I was trying to encourage reading. So I would, you know, me and James talk about books for a little bit. Um, but it's kind of unnecessary. It just adds more time. I mean, of course you want content, but I want concise content. I want to do like a recap podcast. So I would tell myself to not do those type of segments. I was doing band segments where I wanted to, you know, I'm a Richmond guy. I got a little, I got a little audience. I want to plug my Richmond band's friends, you know? So I would play their music on my podcast and talk about them too. And looking back, I mean, that was fine, but again, it was kind of leading me away from you know, what the core of my podcast was. It was supposed to be just a recap podcast. So that's what I'm kind of focusing on more now. That's what I've learned is just to, especially with this 1899, I'm watching them as they go and trying to just recap the podcast. Yeah, in Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we had a segment that we looked at a comic book of the week or several comic mm -hmm. books of the week, and I had somebody come in and I would do underlay music in it and would run for up to like 10 minutes or so during the middle of the podcast. And for the listener after the fact, it was pretty good. We recorded live. So it was a little bit awkward for us at the time, 
I would say, and then eventually I broke that out into its own podcast, Legends of Shield Longbox Edition, and it just became more and more work to the point where I didn't have time to do it. And then segments started stacking up to my contributors to the point where I had apologized to them and said, look, I, I don't have time to get to it. And a very good friend of mine, he was one of the contributors and he sent in the segment and I told him, look, if I can't get it out this week, we have to shelve this. I mean, I, I have all your stuff at some point in time, I might get it out, but if I don't get it to it now, it's just not going to happen because I just don't have enough hours in the day, hours in the week to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have time for it. And like I said, I apologized profusely to him and said, I, I just, I can't, I just don't, I don't have the time as a hobby podcaster. I don't have the time. If it was my job, I probably wouldn't have time to do it. Cause it was like the seventh podcast of the week that I was doing. It was just crazy back then. So I had to shelve that it was a bridge too far and I couldn't do it. You said you have roughly about 50 listeners to the podcast, really engaged community. Mm -hmm. How do you handle promotion? Are you trying to promote outside that community or are you literally just a community-based podcast? I was just focused on that community for a bit because I was, you know, I had the, the, the Facebook you know, Wheel of Time TV series group and then I, I promote on Instagram on Instagram, I like to do like a three-step promotion, which I kind of learned from politics, which is, you know, first you announce that you're going to announce something. First, you announce that you're going to release something, and then you announce that you released it, and then you remind people that you released it. So I like to do that three steps on Instagram over like, usually over like a week's period of time. And in between that, I always like to make sure that I post normal stuff in between. I don't want to just be like a promoter for my show all the time on my Instagram. For outreach for the new podcast, I say new, but it's like pretty much the same group that I was listening to before. I started doing the 1899 one, which I got very lucky by finding a couple of really dedicated 1899 groups on Reddit and again on Facebook. And I think that's a, way, a great way to find, that's how I found my audience and it's recently grown to 350 that's something i wanted to share with you that just recently in the past few weeks it's it has kicked up and i do know people are talking on some podcast subreddits about there's like errant android issues going on with Samsung. podcasts right now yeah. um that's not the case here because i'm i'm not only getting you know, like 350 listens for the past two 1899 podcasts but i'm getting more emails more followers, you know, a lot more integration with people. And I believe it's strictly through the Reddit groups. That's where it get the, the biggest crowd and not, not through the podcast, but through like the subject matter itself. So like if your podcast is about gardening, go to a gardening group and post there a lot and be part of the conversation. And every now and then drop in the fact that you have a podcast. <laughs> Yeah, it's called the 80-20 rule, where at least 80%, at least 80% of your interactions should be not about what you're promoting, and then 20% sure. of your interactions can be about what you're promoting. I think that ratio has gotten bigger now, whereas I think it's more like 90-95% to 5-10% now than the 80-20 rule, but the 80-20 rule was a standard for quite some time with social media and promoting, so totally get what you're saying right there. You mentioned that you were having some problems with your Chromebook, the two gigabit computer that you were using, and your audio program. You've lost recordings before, right? Oh, yes. Um, at least twice. How'd you deal with that? And I think in both cases, I was lucky enough where James, <laughs> the hero of the day, like had awkward actually recorded on his end as well and had some feed for me. I don't think I've ever lost anything podcast wise, but there was a very embarrassing moment where I was at a, a band practice recently. I did join a band earlier this year. I'm not with them anymore, but I was playing with them for a few months, came with all my recording stuff and I recorded like an hour of silence when we were supposed to be jamming. 
So that it didn't go over very well. That was that was maybe worse than <laughs> losing a podcast. Because I think with a podcast, if you do lose a podcast and you don't have a podcast for the week, in my opinion, I think it's completely acceptable to either not post a podcast and not make a big deal about it or post like a brief, like five minute thing about why you don't have a podcast that week. Or what I was doing for a while is James and I were always recording like one week ahead. So whatever I was releasing that week was what we recorded the week before. And eventually it caught up with me, but that was a really nice thing to fall back on so that, you know, if something happened one week, I would have another week to fall back on. Now at this point, I have a, um, we talked before about how I, um, I didn't want to do all those segments, the book segment, the band segments. So I've gone and re-edited my old Wheel of Time podcast. So they're just recaps, but I haven't released them all yet. I've released four of them. And the other four are just on the back burner. I've already re- already edited them. They're already ready to go. So if I ever need to release them, I will. And so for me, if I lost a week, that's what I would do is just release one of those. Did you just re-edit them or did you remaster mm-hmm. them? Because we talk about that all oh. the time in the podcasting space of remastering old recordings. Good question. I was able to remaster because of the uh, Soundtrap app. Because I had all the original files in there and they were all just how I'd left them before. So I was able to like start from scratch basically with the original files. Is that what you meant? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. So you're able to do a better job, not only edit for content because you take out all the content that's unnecessary, but you're also making it sound better because exactly. you're improved. Your skills have improved over time on how to actually edit the audio. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And different mics too. I was using a, um, you know, a, one of the sure 57s, a musician mic. That's what I was using for a very long time until I finally converted over to this USB mics, which I got to admit, I like more. Mm. So wait a minute. You took the sure SM 57, the same microphone, the president of the United States uses every time he or she gets up to the pl- podium. Yeah. So you got <laughs> rid of that for that USB microphone. It's a digital age, baby. I don't know what I can say. I mean, I still have that other mic. I still use that to record, like when I record my tube amp, my guitars and stuff. Okay. I still respect the president. Come on. (laughs) I have not gotten rid of any of my microphones that I've accrued over the years, but I think it's time to let it go. Matter of fact, I might start start posting them for sale within the next week or so. That's something that... uh, trying to declutter a little bit and get stuff out of the house. I've got boxes in places where I don't need to have boxes. And we're not talking about anything expensive here. I'm uh, talking mm. about like a bearing or uh, I don't know what it was, 1300 or something like that. You know, the bottom line microphones, just get them out and some kids somewhere can use them. I'll donate them if I need to just get them out of here. Everybody's ears are perking up, man. Make sure you put them on the discord when you do that. I will. I will indeed. So you've, not totally ingrained in the podcasting space, but if there was something that you could point to to say, I wish podcasting didn't have this associated with it. Hmm. Do you have anything like that? I do. Yeah, I kind of do. Um, I feel kind of bitchy, but I don't like the uh, when I guess all the celebrities and TV stars started turning to podcasting as well. I mean, I understand why they do it because it's fun and they get control of their content that way. And I can all, I can absolutely understand what a stand-up comedian or improv actors. It's an absolutely appropriate medium, but I, you know, I saw like a lot of, I don't know. I, I'm not a big fan of, of the big names getting into podcasting. Alec Baldwin is an example that we could throw in there. He had a podcast for a while. The ex-president of the United States of America got into podcasting with Bruce Springsteen. I mean, I don't understand. It was just reaching out through a new medium and thought that they not only could make some money off of it through ad revenue and stuff like that, but also to try to reach a new generation of people. Because 
I'm going to use this expression, kids these days don't exactly <laughs> park their butts in CNN. Remember, that back in the day, 1990, 1991, when you had Iraq that invaded Kuwait, what was everybody watching consistently throughout the day? What was on every single TV in a lobby space or where were people gathering around? They were gathering around CNN. Well, mm-hmm. those days are over. Well, yeah, CNN is still there and people still watch it. But if you just made an example that you listen to a political podcast, you probably get more of your political news from that podcast than you would from CNN or NBC or Fox or wherever, right? 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's probably why the former president of the United States did that. <laughs> I, I, could, I, I do understand the appeal of it too, but. I don't know. I think there's so many good voices and good, you know, comedians that are trying to use that to get noticed, but they're getting drowned out by, you know, bigger names. Okay. Um, so you think crowding is an issue with this in the space in its I'm totality? Not, not for me, of course, but I mean, in general, when I, when I see that, um, you know, Zach Shepard has like the number one podcast out there and, you know, him and his wife, I don't know. It, I, I just wish that that attention would, you know, go to like a, a, a podcast, a podcast that podcast did, and that's their only thing. I'll tell you, after watching the industry the past three or four years, it's just been phenomenal, where it went from mostly a hobby mom and pop sh- sort of shop where people were just clamoring. We just want to be noticed. We want to be treated like we're mainstream to the explosion that it is today with Spotify and with all of these other name brands that are recognized by the average person, iHeartRadio, whatever. And so people know what podcasts are. They might not listen to them, but at least they know or think they know what a podcast is. And it's just in the lexicon today. So that's where all the money is, like billions and billions of dollars are in podcasting now because people have learned in industry that we, they can advertise through podcasts, but it takes audiences to do that. If you can come in with a ready-made audience, mm-hmm. like the former president of the United States, like Alec Baldwin, like all, any of these other stars that get into podcasting, why not? Because you have people that can come in and do that. All right. Uh, let's talk about some of the comments from the chat, right? So we had Liberty Dude post a few things. I'm going to show them up on the screen. One of the first thing that he put on as a comment was who could hate the wheel of time nobody because the book is fabulous it might be a dense read but i think he's referring to the tv show he or she he okay he might be saying who could hate the wheel of time tv show i hope that's what he's saying because it is a good tv show it strays from the book material it's you know more ready made for tv but i mean i agree there's so many people there's, I would say, like you were talking about your 80-20 rule for, um, for promotions. It's 80-20 for Wheel of Time fans. 80% of the book readers hate the show. And the other 20% of us, you know, either think it's okay or we love it. I mean. <laughs> I have a similar thing from where I grew from. Starship Troopers, the movie. A lot of people think of it as a cheap sci-fi movie or whatever. The book actually was pretty in-depth and, and pretty serious. And they took that and made it to a campy sci-fi movie. There's those of us that didn't read the book and really enjoyed the movie for what it was. But the people that were ingrained in the book, they saw the movie and they're like, that's not what it is. And after learning more about the book, I can completely understand where they came <laughs> from. So, you know, the, the whole thing is, is there. And you have that conversation every time you take a book and you turn it into a film. Liberty Dude also noted... You noted you reviewed Time Bandits. Are you expanding to other time travel stories? Basically what he's asking. Well, yeah, at first, you know, when we ran out of doing the recaps of Sweet Child of Time, and I wanted to keep doing a weekly podcast, I guess it's something I should stress, is that I was trying to keep going weekly, even though the show I was doing was done. So I decided to take that time thing. So that is absolutely why I chose Time Bandits. And then we started doing... I wanted to do Time Rangers because James, you know, is associated with the Power Rangers and the Sentai subculture. But instead, I chose to do Ninja Steel instead because Zoe Robbins, who's in Wheel of Time, was also a Power Ranger. 
in Ninja Steel. So there was a good kind of tie-in there. But no, I did debate doing that, but instead I chose because Wheel of Time Season 2 is coming up. And I want to get myself ready for when a show broadcasts, watching it and then immediately taking my notes and then immediately podcasting and releasing that podcast within the next couple of days. So I want to get used to that. So when 1899 came out, I decided to use that approach, which is what I'm doing right now with that. And as it turns out, I changed the name of the show, Sweet Child of 1899, for those episodes. But it time looks like it's going to be a, a big key component of this show. So it kind of, I would like to try to keep it time, but I'm not going to, is what I'm trying to say. I'm going to just keep continue with the sweet child, but I'm going to skip on trying to do the time thing. And if we do another show, I'm just going to the sweet child of something else. A couple of things. First of all, if you're doing a review show or a recap show on a TV show, absolutely the next day or at the bare minimum, 48 hours later is the sweet spot to get new people views on your list, their ears on your podcast. That's absolutely what you want to do. Also talking about your off season issues. If mm-hmm. you have an IP that's big enough, like star Wars or Marvel, like I do on legends of shield, the off season is no big deal. Actually with the Marvel cinematic universe, there's hardly any off season. There's always something yep. going on. <laughs> so we don't really have to worry about it anymore. We did originally but we don't have to worry about it anymore. Star Wars is much like the same way there. I did another podcast on the CW TV show Arrow, which is in the DC universe about the Green Arrow. The show was called Arrow. In the off season, the show actually bloomed out an entire universe called the Arrowverse. It's really the DC comic universe. But the Arrowverse, and it had several different shows, at least five, if not six shows. I'm trying to think back in the day when they had them all running. It was either five or six. So we chose another show, which was Legends of Tomorrow. And we podcasted on that in our off season. So it was still in the Arrowverse. A lot of times, actually, the main character was from Arrow to begin with. But it was a different show. So that's how we handled it. So there's different ways that you can handle it. It's kind of rough when you're throwing yourself into a relatively new IP and there's not much that you can do in the off season for agents of shield. When we were covering that in the original years for legends of shield, there were conventions and we would either go to conventions or we would listen to panels and we would talk about that. We talk about news of upcoming movies and stuff like that. Again, with wheel of time, there's not much you can do. I mean, you could do book reviews or or a chapter review. You can't actually read the book but you could do that. So there's different things you can do. You've chosen to do another show. That's great. You want to do a weekly podcast. You can do that. I would argue maybe you don't want all that on the same RSS feed, but it's the way you've chosen how to do it. And it seems to be working for you. So I'm not, there's no right or wrong answer in podcasting. Whatever anybody tells you, there's no right or wrong answer. There are best practices, but there's no right or wrong answers. If it's working for you, keep on going with it. All right, let's move on to the next comment. Actually, you might know this. It's from Mostly Speaking Sentai. Oh, yeah, baby. Said, loose inside of structure is how I roll. It absolutely is. He adds a lot of fun to podcasting. Um, I, Yeah, it wouldn't be the same without him. Yeah, I do it with Nate. And Nate's really fun to podcast with as well. James has practiced on the mic. So, yeah. <laughs> His structure is very fun. If yeah, if you're a fan of James, you'll love his. He has like four or five podcasts that he you talk you talk about your rule of two, do no more than two podcasts a week at a time to focus on, and um, I can't see how I could do more than one. And I think James has like four or five regular ones he does. So he's not listening to your rule. He's not listening to you. It's not sustainable over the long term. And now, if you have a crew behind you, that's different. But or if you're doing it for your job, that's different. But the rule is based on hobby podcasters and it's based on interacting with the community. It's based on get preparing for new podcasts and then promoting your podcast. That's what the rule is based off of. And like I just said, there's no right or wrong answer. There's just best practices. 
And we have a final comment from Liberty Dude. He said, with your podcast focusing on a current running show, do you try to listen to other podcasts on the show? Do you think of possible cross-show collaborations? I do not. Um, I made a conscious choice to do that because that's usually what I do is like when I into a show, I'll read the Vulture recap, you know, on print. And then I'll listen to like the bald move because bald move is doing 1899, but I had to stay away. I'm not watching ahead, so I don't want any spoilers. And I kind of want to like compare notes with other podcasts when I'm done with mine. I will absolutely listen to the bald move 1899 podcast when I'm done. They're doing it differently in theirs. They're doing it like within an RS feed as well except for they have kind of like a broad umbrella rss feed where they just kind of throw whatever show they want in there and it's just kind of thrown in the pile i'm tempted (laughs) but i'm not doing it for legends of shield i am open to other collaborations i've tried a few collaborations with other specific marvel podcasters and they for whatever reason, have said no so far, but I'm open to it. So if you're a Marvel podcaster out there, I'm open to a collaboration. I know my co-hosts are as well. Cool. All right. A couple of final questions here before I let you go for the night. First, think of your podcast. Think of all the episodes of your podcast. Oh. And then think of one. It doesn't have to be the best. It doesn't have to be, you know, whatever. It's just the one that's on the tip of your mind a favorite moment from all of those podcasts? What is it? Um, <laughs> it was a, uh, you know, like I said, James has not seen Wheel of Time and he, uh, you know, was just watching the show along with me. And so he's just, you know, noticing things as they come up. And he just so happened to make an, a keen observation that's like a major spoiler for the entire series of Wheel of Time. He just happened to pick up on it as just a jokey aside. And I didn't, I don't even think I told him about it, but I definitely took that clip, that like one and a half minute clip and showed it to the other people from the, uh, that wheel of time TV series group. And I was like, look, he's onto it. He, it was, (laughs) that was a wonderful moment. Just him just haphazardly like stepping on a big spoiler that he wasn't even aware of. A blind squirrel will find a nut every once in a while. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> so besides 1899 and the second season of wheel of time do you have any future plans for your podcasting absolutely because i really want to do it weekly and getting a big boost in numbers having like you know the 350 people that have consistently followed like for the last couple of episodes i know they're fans of 1899 first and foremost which means they're probably also fans of that great show dark And so that's what I'm thinking about maybe leaning towards is doing a recap of the show Dark. Or maybe possibly going back to the um, the little house on the prairie well again, (laughs) because I keep thinking about that or maybe Highway to Heaven, because I don't think anybody's done. a. I mean, I'm sure somebody has. I know about some little house on the prairie recap podcasts that are already out there. I don't know about any Highway to Heaven ones, so I wouldn't mind doing that. Yeah, I know there's a lot of retro podcasts out there because it's all available to stream somewhere by now, or you can watch it on TV or whatever, on like free TV, whatever that free TV is for you, whether it's a streaming app like Tubi or a local free channel. I know there's a lot of that. Like there's a a Andy Griffin show podcast. I believe there's Leave It to Beaver podcast where they get a lot of the actual actors and behind the scenes production personnel in there. And stuff like that. So yeah, it's it's all possible. You know, a lot of the older people involved in Little House of the Prairie have sadly passed away for you know, you want to say sadly or not. I know there's a lot of controversy with that show as well behind the scenes, but there are still I mean, there was a lot of kids that you could kid actors, child actors that you could probably grab and have on your show too. So yeah, have fun with that. Yeah, thank you. And I'm leaning towards the dark, though, because like with these new fans, 1899, it seems like a natural progression is like to do a show from the same people that did the previous show. Well, the important thing is you have options. 
I do. And I only want to do shows that I like. I'm not going to do <laughs> anything I don't like because that's what I'm doing is for fun. If I'm not having fun, I don't want to do it. Well, you've been talking about podcasting for about an hour here. Is there mm-hmm. anything left? Is, is there any note that you've taken that you're just like, man, I just, I need to say this about podcasting before I get off here because I'll never forgive myself if <laughs> I don't say this in the show. I mean, I wrote down so many notes and I didn't even say any of them. So do you want to just start going through all my notes now? <laughs> Your most important part. Let's do that. Just one. <laughs> no, I really do not. I think we've pretty much touched on everything. Other than the fact that I apologize for being negative about celebrities doing podcasts, I feel bad having negative opinions, but um, you're not the first one on this show to state (laughs) that about how the industry has focused on that versus the discovery of other great content, but without the star celebrity on it. So there's a discoverability question in there. There's been this thing for about 10 years there podcasting has a discoverability problem i don't think it does i just think you need to work the seo or search engine optimization in order to be discoverable and you do that through promotion and a lot of the things you were talking about and it's been working for you growing from 50 to 350 in whatever stats program that you're working so that's uh, and your interactions are growing and everything so i think you're doing a good job no thanks I think I, um, I guess one last point is I kind of succinct everything when I first started trying to reach out to people, just kind of succinct things down to like one word, either hashtags or search terms on Reddit, Facebook, Instagram. For me, at first, it was like cassette, DIY, you know, stoner, bedroom recordings. That was the first things and the first outreach. I found other people with those same hashtags. Did the same thing with Wheel of Time in 1899. Just search for those hashtags for those. And you just find so many people that are into it and so many people that goof on it. You know, I like the people that goof on it. (laughs) Yeah, hashtags are really instrumental. So on Twitter, if you plan to continue to use that, whoever's listening to this, I would search for a couple of hashtags that you think are relevant about whatever subject matter you're doing. And Sometimes people will put like five or six or maybe even up to 10 hashtags. So you get to see all the relevant ones. You can do searches. You can see how popular Mm -hmm. they are and roll with those for your posts. On Mastodon, if you've transitioned over there, I know discoverability is almost exclusively with hashtags. So same sort of thing. Start searching hashtags. You can follow hashtags over on Mastodon which is a Twitter replacement over there. You can actually do that versus following people, or you can do both. And that's a great way to do that. Hashtags work on Instagram and Facebook. From what I've been told, hashtags, I don't think work on Reddit. Mm-hmm. Do they? Have you seen that? No. That, I've yeah. never done a hashtag on Reddit. No, I have never either. So you mentioned, you, you kind of alluded to that in your statement. I was like, I don't think that <laughs> actually works. But, you know, finding the right subreddit is yes. always a key. Is that your peeps right there? Yeah. Okay. Well, Steve, thank you very much for coming on this conversation with me. Where's the best place for our better podcasting audience to find Sweet Child of Time? Well, you know, it's on all the socials and all the um, you know, streamers, but Sweet Child of Time Pod is going to be my Instagram. And I post a lot of stuff on my band page, which is intro.void. Either one of those Instagrams are great to follow because I usually do cross promotions on both of those. My podcast is Sweet Child of Time, and that's on the Marshland Media Network and pod in the, excuse me. <laughs> The uh, website for them is mlmpod.com. And we also have a Discord for Marshland Media. So that's where my podcast is on there too. And we'll be upcoming Sweet Child of Time Season 2 for Wheel of Time Season 2 whenever that starts up. Yeah, Sweet Child of Time Pod. Or if you want to email us at Sweet Child of Sweet Child of Time Pod at gmail.com. There's a lot to say there. Myself and SP here, I think we exchanged 18 emails through that um, exchange. Is that too many emails? 
No, in doing what we were setting up, no, absolutely not. I apologize. <laughs> a couple of times I, I was gone because I was dealing with other things. And of course, there's a Thanksgiving holiday in there as well. But yeah, no, that's, it's, that's fine for me. For other people, I don't know. Maybe that might be too many. But if you're getting ready for a collaboration, one thing I wanted to say this this week, and I'm glad you brought it up. One thing that I want to thank is every single person that I've had in this conversation has been very gracious with their ability to communicate back and forth. I won't say relentless. I won't say aggravating. It's been really fun communicating back and forth, and it's been proactive. So I just want to say thank you to everybody that I've had on Better Podcasting with SB, including you, Steve, on being very proactive and being very communicative back and forth and getting ready for our conversation. So thank you very much. I thank you for having me. It's been it's been great. I feel like just like with the uh <laughs> with that Artemis, I kind of stepped in a you know a big arena that I'm not really ready for, but I'm just doing my best and having fun. That's the best thing to do with podcasting. Have fun. That's the whole premise of better podcasting. So thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for spending your time with Steve and me over the past hour. If you like content like this, please subscribe to the Better Podcasting YouTube channel, like the video, ring that bell, or so the YouTubers tell me. I don't really know what that does. Somebody <laughs> will tell me at some point. Or if you are listening to this audio version on Better Podcasting Chats with SP podcast, please select a follow on your podcatcher app of choice or subscribe, whatever it's called. Stephen and I would greatly appreciate it. Now, tomorrow night, Stephen and I will be recording episode 266 of the Better Podcasting main show. You can find that at geeks.live at 7 p.m. Eastern time. For this show, Better Podcasting Chats with SP, next week, I'll be connecting with Smoking and Drinking in Spaces, Jason. We have done a lot of collaborations in the past, and I'm finally getting a, a chance to have him on this show for a conversation. Really looking forward to that. Uh, there's some serious topics to discuss there and some fun topics to discuss there. So it'll be a mixed bag next week. In the meantime, join the podcasting conversation on our Discord server, betterpodcasting.com slash Discord. You can find both Steven and myself there every day. See everybody next time.